Next, term limits. The House Rules Committee met today to consider a rule governing future floor debate of a bill that would limit terms of legislators. The full House is expected to debate the bill later this month. We'll show you a portion of the meeting. It runs about an hour. Mr. Conyers has returned, and uh, Mr. Conyers, feel free to uh, summarize your, uh, without objection, your full statement will be uh, accepted in the record. And welcome to the committee again. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be at Rules again, as usual. Uh, this is an important issue, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it's not clear to me that there is a direct relationship between the national debt and the imposition of term limits. I, I presume that, that that may be the case. It, it is also not clear to me uh, that the uh, whole question of experience, which normally uh, for lawyers, uh, for businessmen, for educators, uh, means something, uh, has now been almost summarily uh, discontinued or discounted. Uh, I, I thought uh, that we were on term limits, uh, that our term limits were every two years there was an, an election, and uh, uh, if, uh, if you didn't get reelected, your term had been limited. It was limited immediately. Evidently, you didn't sign that contract uh, for America. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm not a signatory. And, and then, of course, uh, the it's, notion it's, that... It's still open. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's getting a little bit uh, raggedy around the edges right now. Uh, uh, it, it's a pretty open secret uh, that we have now had to delay uh, the, the term limits bill, which was to have been on the floor next week. Uh, here we are with a with the Judiciary Committee, uh, all of us uh, supposed to be on the floor with one of the largest uh, legal reform measures uh, of, the, of the century, probably. Uh, and, and we're up here talking about the rules that would obtain on a measure that has already been announced last night will not come up until the end of this month, in March. And so I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, a, I'm a little bit disoriented as to why, uh, why we're having uh, a, a hearing on rules on term limits when it's not clear uh, what, what it is we're going to be doing with it. Uh, I come here uh, to argue uh, a very important question that came up in the Judiciary Committee because we rejected an amendment which would have made the measure applicable to members of the House and Senate who are currently serving. Uh, that's a little bit different from retroactivity. And with, uh, w when you consider that uh, the uh, 12 years of service uh, would, would not affect the members that are presently sitting that have voted this historic amendment, then add seven years for the ratification process among the two-thirds of the states. We're talking about all of us who have done this historic act uh, that's being talked about here today. Uh, it wouldn't kick in for probably uh, 19 years or so. And uh, that, that yep. is a, Mr. a Chairman, very... Mr. Chairman, you probably outlived the signatories who want term limits. <laughs> Well, there, there certainly would be very few people around that ever uh, supported it in the first instance. And so, you know, what, what, uh, what I'm concerned with uh, as one who has questioned whether, in, as, especially since we're having more turnover in the uh, federal legislature uh, lately than ever before, uh, it, 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 con it mystifies me uh, why term limits uh, now except that people think that they want them and I think that we should bring it up but but is there a case to be made for it that is compelling 
to amend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I, I'm not at all certain that that has happened. And so my view would, would come down to this. Uh, as, as one who uh, has to campaign rigorously every two years, uh, I, would, I would think that I am being, uh, my term is up for limit and review every two years. But to suggest that uh, my reelection activity is preventing me from doing my job, a notion uh, offered by one of my colleagues on judiciary, I rather uh, firmly reject. I don't think the members here are doing anything wrong by campaigning to get reelected, to tell people what they're doing, uh, and to satisfy or in the case of many people in the, the last uh, election, uh, dissatisfy people about what they're doing so that they, they don't get back at all. So uh, I thought elections were what this country were, was all about, that you, you, you seek re-election and campaign based on what, what you're doing. I like the idea of connecting campaign finance reform to a notion of term limitation, which I think would be uh, very, very important. And so freely admitting my opposition to term limits, we believe that if, if it is a, a, a measure whose time has come, that there must be the consistency that requires us to be able to uh, have them take immediate effect. It seems to me that that's the, the very least that we could do. And so I, I don't see any, any reason for us to be rushing to a rule. And if there is a rule, my case would be for those of us who don't want to submit a, 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 a substitute amendment, that we allow perfecting amendments, which would allow the uh, kind of proposal uh, that would be uh, least objectionable from my point of view uh, to, to be able to, to kick in. So it's, uh, I, I think that the anti-democratic nature of term limits is, uh, is, 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 has been aired here by your own uh, committee members. Uh, we're taking away the people's right to choose whomever they want. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact that we've had 52% uh, uh, turnover in House members elected since 1990 ought to speak uh, uh, effectively uh, for the, the, the unnecessary uh, uh, need of term limits. And of course, the bill that is before you is totally inconsistent. And so for those reasons, uh, I, I would urge that we have a rule that if someone said a couple of hours debate on a constitutional amendment, it would seem to me if we were going to do this that there should be a, a much fuller... Who said that? I thought I heard my colleague here saying a, a, a several hours, a, two or three hours, I think he said. Uh, that's, that's, so I, I think that we, we need, a, 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 if we're going to amend the Constitution every other week, that we really ought to give it some, some debate. And, and I don't think that we've been doing that. And, and for those reasons, uh, I, uh, I would ask that we have a perfecting amendments, an open rule, and a, a liberal debate time on a constitutional amendment. I thank the chairman and the members for allowing me to testify again before you. <coughs> well, we certainly... Uh thank uh, all three of uh, you gentlemen for your testimony and uh, Mr. Conyers let me just say to you first of all that um, we cannot we the Congress cannot amend the Constitution uh, every other week only the American people can amend the Constitution and uh, uh, this is a constitutional amendment uh, which is being proposed to be put to the people of the uh, of the United States um, certainly uh, I don't think the American people in the history of this country have ever enacted an amendment uh, that was anti-democratic. I can't think of one, although there are a couple I disagree with, like limiting the presidency to, uh, to two terms, perhaps. Uh, but uh, you raise the question of why we are having this hearing today uh, when this legislation will not 
reach the floor for a couple of weeks. And that's a good question to, to raise. But uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, members of this Congress are confused. Uh, there are, at last count, about 12 different uh, proposals, uh, many of them overlapping. Uh, the media, and I've just finished an interview outside here with the, with the media, uh, they are confused. They don't understand all of these proposals. And the reason for this meeting today, this hearing, is to have members, regardless of whether you're for or against or you, whether you are for variations, is to have the opportunity to testify before this committee, covered by C-SPAN, incidentally, uh, which will allow the media and the American people to better understand what this issue is, what the pros and cons are, and then, over the next two weeks, uh, let that grassroots movement, whether it's for or against, uh, or for a particular proposal, let them, uh, uh, let the American people have some say into this. So I think it's a very good move to have this hearing today. And uh, uh, again, we're not going to take up this bill on the floor for until I believe the earliest is March 27th, sometime before we break for the uh, for the Easter recess. And uh, uh, so that's why we're doing it to here. Now, Mr. McCollum, I have a question. Uh, Would the chairman uh, I'd be glad to, yes. for an observation? Could, could we have taken it up at a time when uh, a, a hugely important bill on product liability reform, which uh, obtains to this Judiciary Committee, which all of us and a number of other witnesses on, uh, would, would not have been on the floor. Well, John, it just shows goes to show you uh, you uh, you are the ranking Democrat on uh, maybe one of the or perhaps the most important committee in the Congress, and unfortunately for you, uh, you've had a great deal of activity uh, in these first uh, 60 or 65 days, and uh, there's no way to prevent that. But I'm sure you are being well represented down on the uh, the floor by your other able members on both sides of the aisle, and we're going to try to get you back down there as soon as you can. Uh, uh, so that you, you can do diligent work on your uh, on the bill on the floor, and hopefully members aren't going to take up that much time uh, to delay you here. But we'll see about that. And I thank the gentleman, Mr. McCollum. Uh, you had uh, uh, three proposals uh, which you you spoke about, uh, um, and you mentioned uh, the one that was not clear to me was the three four year term proposal. Yes. And how does that affect uh, uh, the Senate? Uh, well, the how would it prevent uh, a member of Congress from running against a senator? And that's what they have great concern about over right. there, naturally. They don't want some, uh, some of our dynamic members in the House to, uh, to be taking them on. What, how, explain well, that to I'll us one more time. I will give credit to Mr. Hoke, who created this concept. But knowing that there has been a historical problem with the four-year proposal, the lengthening of terms, in addition to limiting them, because the other body has not been desirous of having the competition in off election years, of having a, a House member have a free ride, so to speak, to run against a senator, uh, the division, the di what we devised, I guess, and put in this, is a provision that would say, uh, if you are serving in the last year of a House term, or for that matter, the last year of a Senate term, it works both ways, then you're free to make a run for the other body uh, as a senator, or if you're a senator, run for a House term. On the other hand, if you're not, if you're in the middle somewhere of your term, whether that be a four-year House term or a six-year Senate term, you have to resign to run if it's in any other year other than the last year. So it's a very simple way of avoiding that problem. Uh, and it's the three, uh, I would stress again, the three four-year terms would run concurrently with the presidential term and would allow our public to focus uh, each four, every four years on electing the entire 435 House members at one time. Uh, and it would, I think, provide a great focal point for debate and for change when those occasions occurred. So that's my preference. But you understand that the base bill I've introduced is not that bill. It's the other variation I have to substitute on today, which is the six two-year House terms and the two, two six-year Senate terms. But I just personally prefer the three, four, and a lot of our members do. I, I think uh, more prefer that than the six years or the eight years. Well, I have a, a lot of questions that, uh, that I would like to ask. Since we are not going to uh, act on this rule today, I would like to ask unanimous consent that we, um, uh, we be able to uh, pose questions to any of you and perhaps get some answers in before we close out the, uh, the record on this tomorrow. Uh, Certainly. And again, uh, out of courtesy of Mr. Conyers, I know he wants to get back down to the floor. I will uh, not ask any more questions at this time and would yield to the Chairman Emeritus, um, Mr. Quillen of Tennessee, for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I signed a contract with America 
but the contract only makes a provision that these measures go to the floor of the House. And in this case, there's no obligation to vote for term limit. I'm opposed to term limit. I will vote against it because I think of the framers of our Constitution knew what they were doing when they wanted the House of Representatives to be close to the people. Knowing full well they set the term at two years, they had to run and be elected every two years, and the people, after all, are the judge of the success of any politician running for office. You don't make politics a career. And the danger of term limits is this. If you set a term at 12 years, or six or eight or whatever, the people have in their mind that that member of the House is elected for 12 years and there will be no campaign. It'll be somewhat of a free ride. And I don't think that's right. We shouldn't take the power of the people away from their decision as to whether or not they want a member of this body to be reelected. Term limits will not affect me. And I know in Tennessee, I came out strongly against term limits. But the two United States senators who were elected were for term limits. Other members of Congress from Tennessee are for term limits. But I say the people set the term limits of any elected body. You don't find the mayor of any city. You don't find the county executive of any county. You don't find anybody has a mandate to run for an elective office for a certain length of time. Tennessee has a term limit on the a governor's race, and I think that's wrong, two term. The President of the United States has a limit, two term, and I think that's wrong. The people decide everyone's destiny, and the framers of our Constitution evidently had more than a crystal ball because the Constitution of the United States has not been amended many times, a very few times. And I think it's withstood the trials and tribulations and ideas of people who wanted to amend it for their advantage. Having said that, Mr. McCullough, I don't think we should tolerate uh, uh, amending the Constitution for a political advantage. In other words, if you want a four-year term for members of the Congress, give them to, the freedom to do whatever they want to, not on a limitation that you have to protect this senator. And that's not a constitutional way to do things. Mr. And I, uh, uh, let me finish. Sure. I, I, think, uh, I think that proposal uh, should not even fly at all. Whatever goes to the floor, whatever <coughs> passes, if it passes at all, ought to be a, a clear understanding that a person is not elected for any term limit set, that they ought to have uh, opposition if, if they're not doing a good job. And I think that that's the way our founding fathers would have it. And let me ask you a question, Mr. McCullough. How Certainly. many terms have you served? I have served now in, in going on my eighth term, Mr. Pullen, and it is far in excess of the 12 years that I advocate, and I believe that when we get term limits in place, I'll be like Mr. Solomon. I'll be ready to walk out of here. I'd be more than happy to walk out today if Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Gebhardt, Mr. Bielenson, Mr. Mokley, well, a lot of other people I walked know out you the would, same time, doing too. A good job. But I don't think that's the answer. I don't criticize you for your view at all. And I appreciate that. And Mr. Conyers, I appreciate you, the good work you do, not because you are against term limits as I am, but I think you 
have read carefully the Constitution of the United States, as I'm sure Mr. McCollum has, and the gentleman from Florida, I think that all of you, Mr. Kennedy, have read the Constitution. You're doing a good job in committee. I shall not prolong. I won't ask any further questions. I think I made my position crystal clear. I'll vote in accordance with the contract of America to let this matter go to the floor. But then there's no obligation as far as my signature on the contract goes to vote for the measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm sure siding with the uh, distinguished gentleman from Tennessee is uh, the next uh, member, Mr. Moakley. Actually, uh, after listening to Mr. Quillen, I really don't have too much to say. Uh, but uh, I'd like to refer to your statement. The press was was all confused about term limit. Did they ask anything about product liability or the legal pro programs we got down there? I think that's where all the mystification is they, about the term limits. The gentleman uh, is correct. They did ask me about it, and I told him it was going to pass overwhelmingly with Democrat support, as have all the other uh, items in the contract for America. Did you include term limits? I didn't get to that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that's what he asked you about, term limits. We were talking about unconfusing the confused press. Uh, it's true, I, I imagine, at the present time, you don't have the votes to pass term limits on the floor, so... Unfortunately, I don't think we do at the present time, but uh, that's the reason for this hearing. It's, uh, it's to give a two-week delay so that the American people can really look at it and let them understand. Joe, the one thing that I think that the people need to understand is that this Congress, and this was brought up by my friend Mr. Conyers, cannot, this Congress cannot amend the Constitution. Uh, this Congress can recommend it, and it is then given to the 50 states. And then 38 of the 50 states have to make a decision as to whether or not to ratify the, uh, the, the, uh, the action of this, uh, this Congress. No. So it's not up to us. It's up to the American people. And, and over the next two weeks, I expect they will speak very vociferously uh, to their members of Congress about this issue. Well, do you, do you think that they, they want a clean house? Uh, or they just want to take the people who got elected the last two terms and get rid of them? Well, I think they want this Congress to, uh, to act responsibly, and uh, they feel overwhelmingly that this Congress has not done that. And again, that has to do with the, uh, with the chart I showed you. For a $4.5 trillion debt certainly uh, cannot be construed as acting responsibly, and the American people feel very strongly about that. Mr. Conyers wanted to know what the connection was between term limitations uh, and the, uh, the national debt and the balanced budget. Uh, I think there is every connection in the world because, in my opinion, term limitations will help to bring about fiscal sanity in this body. Members will come here, they will serve for a few years, they will say no to, uh, to some people, uh, and then they will go back home and uh, uh, live out their careers, and that's the way it should be, in my opinion. But don't you think, if you really want to carry term limits out to where the people want it, that everybody's serving in Congress over a certain amount of years when this bill passes, should just uh, read what the bill is all about and just pack up and go home. Yep, and I intend to do that. When this, uh, if this becomes law, I will not serve another term after that. And you have my word on that, sir. Will you quit if we just pass it on the floor? No, because then I'd leave you here, and I think uh, somebody... <laughs> and I'm taking you with me when I go. <laughs> I told you, you're working in the kitchen, though. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, Mr. Goss, Thank another you. Floridian. Boy, we're, they're all over the place. Well, Florida is a, is a state that has uh, exercised a lot of leadership in many areas, and uh, this is one of the areas they've exercised some leadership. So uh, members from Florida do have a certain acquaintance with this uh, subject, and uh, most of us have uh, some feelings and have done some research on it. And I don't want to hold these gentlemen up from uh, going back to this uh, very important and equally confusing subject on the floor of the House right now, product liability and how we're going to deal with it. But I did want to make a couple of observations very quickly. I'm not sure I agree with the proposition that uh, has been proposed by uh, Mr. Conyers, my good friend from Tennessee, Mr. Quillen, that maybe term limits gets us away from the people. I tend to feel it work the other way. 
having an open seat out there every six years is going to keep a lot of political attention going in anybody's community. And you have to run for your seat every two years. It's true maybe the last two years in a term limit term, you get a chance to make a braver vote than you would make otherwise. And I think that may be good for Congress as an institution. But I think you're really on the hot seat the rest of the time, just the way you are now. And I think that you get a better quality of political interest back in your community because everybody knows uh, that this isn't a career job. This is something then you come and do uh, when you want to give some service to your country or represent the area of the world you happen to live in. And, you know, that's a judgment call. Who knows how it will work? But I'm not ready to accept that term limits separates the elected representative from the official. I just don't think it works that way, and it's, it's not been my experience uh, so far in the, in the states that have talked about this that that's happened. Happy to yield, the gentleman, of course. Uh, would, would the gentleman uh, want to put term limits on all of the uh, other appointed officials, executive ban branch, career employees, and the people that uh, exercise uh, staff capacities here because they're the ones that aren't going, and uh, we'll be turning over and we'll be building up a super bureaucracy that, that is without uh, peer. The gentleman has pointed to an argument we've heard many, many times about the super bureaucracy. And I would suggest that there is a, there is a pretty good instructive answer in what has happened in Washington uh, since November 8th this year. The bureaucracy has literally been turned on its head. And it is apparent that what happens is that when there are term limits and new leadership emerges, new leadership tends to bring with it its own staff. Now, that does not mean to say that there is a sufficient amount of expertise or continuum always, but there seems to be an understanding amongst leadership that you want to have some continuum, but you also want to affect your will as a leader. And that means you're going to bring some of your people and probably keep some of the old. And I think that, in effect, happens. In terms of the professionalism in the executive branch, obviously, Nobody wants to be a doctor for six years and then be something else. I wouldn't want a doctor who only wanted to be a doctor for six years. But that's exactly part of the distinction in the debate. It is a debate between professional careerists as politicians or professional members of Congress, as it were, and, and uh, citizen legislature. That's really the constitutional sort of philosophy that's going on here. Well, the gentleman you Happily. Uh, I think the gentleman has hit upon the very bottom line point of this. Uh, I have a preference for 12 and 12, 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, which is my base underlying bill. But you mentioned the six years and so on. I'm willing to vote for whatever comes up at the end that gets us this end of this careerism, the end of this power structure possibility. But I think that the six-year version yields itself to the criticism of Mr. Conyers far more than 12 in the sense that for a short duration here of six years, the potential is there not necessarily for staff on this hill to run things, but for there to be a lack of the experience to be able to get at this big bureaucracy as big as it is. And my judgment is that six years is just a simply too short a time to turn over a chairmanship, a full committee to someone, or the speakership or leadership as long as government is as big as it is. I'd like to reduce it. And I'm also concerned about the uniformity with the Senate. If we have a term limit that's less for the House than for the Senate, we wind up weakening, in my judgment, the House vis-a-vis -vis the Senate and wind up in a position where you wind up in a conference committee with the House members not as experienced, not as uh, strong in terms of their positions potentially because they don't know it as much. I just think that upsets the constitutional balance. So uh, I just wanted to throw in that point that, that what you're discussing goes to the heart of an interesting sub a debate that will go on, I hope, on the floor that hadn't been brought out here yet today between those who advocate the six-year House limit uh, while still maintaining 12 years in the Senate and those of us who believe, as I do, that 12 years should be the length for both the House and the Senate. Mr. Goss, may I, may I just uh, sure. interject this one thought about careerism? I, I love hearing all of us talk about people that shouldn't have careers in the Congress coming mostly from the people who have careers in the Congress. But what about the uh, citizen voter? What about the person in your district who decides that uh, whether uh, that doesn't like careers uh, can vote you vote you out if you if they don't like careers? I thought the the people in the district should have the ultimate determination as to whether they want someone to have a career in the Congress or not. Isn't that an integral part of the selection process? That, that is uh, certainly, in a, from a philosophical point of 
view. Uh, in a perfect world, in a perfect democracy, I would agree with you that in the abstract it makes no sense to put any type of limitation on a totally free uh, election. Unfortunately, we already do that. First of all, you have to be a certain age. You have to uh, be an American citizen. You have to live in the state. So we understand that there are certain things you've got to do already if you want to do this. It isn't a total free ride. The next question is, do we improve the product if we add other regulations? And this is what this is about. And truly, that is a constitutional question of great interest, of national interest, and it should be dealt with that way. And I think that's why we're doing this and having this early debate. Uh, on the subject. I think that in most Americans' minds, and you said who's going to be around in 19 years when this thing kicks in, if, it, if you know, if you used your scenario, you do. The answer is, I probably won't be, and I don't know who else in the room will be, but at 70, Barney Frank's going to be here. Uh, okay, we know that. But 75% of America out there may not be quite that sure, but 75% of America, a certain percentage of those folks are still going to be around. And those are the folks who are saying, you know, the term limits is really a better way to do it than not, we think. And that's what they're asking us to look into. So whether we're here or not really isn't relevant. It's the people we work for, what they think, and there's certain to be somebody of them that's going to still say, this is a debate we want to proceed through. With regard to my good friend Mr. McCollum's point, I apologize. I did not mean to signal a six-year only. I was using it merely illustratively. I am not taking a position in the 612 debate. I have uh, supported both uh, measures, and uh, I will support whatever will pass uh, on this subject. I have been here six years. I can tell you I do not feel qualified to take over this committee. I, I'll state that flat out. If I had been six years in the majority, I might feel that I was qualified. But I've been six years in the minority, and uh, there are some who feel that the minority has a different role in the majority, and I think there's some truth in that. And I think that is a different learning curve. And I think that does affect. The, the important point is whether or not I could learn to do the job or anybody could learn to do the job to take over the responsibilities as a citizen legislator. And I think the answer to that is yes, they could if they knew that's what the responsibility was. Uh, when you come here, as I did, thinking I would be forever in the minority, uh, I, I took a different role, which was to change that uh, and make it in, make sure that that didn't happen. And to my astonishment, we succeeded. Uh, and now, now we're in the process of trying to deal with that. Uh, and I think that's a very uh, comfortable challenge for those of us who were part of that. Um, that doesn't mean to say that all of the people who are now in the minority, who form the minor majority, don't have something to contribute. Obviously, they do. Look at the debate on the floor we had last night. Look at the debate we're having today. Uh, and that's what makes this place work. The bottom line for America, in my view, is that as an institution, they feel there's sort of an arrogance of power in what has been characterized uh, as a fiefdom mentality here. And, and they would like to see an artificial way to break that up. So when you get away from that pure abstract argument about why are we tampering with the ballot box right that's there, it's because Americans have said, we, we would like you to do that. We would like you to make a way that we don't have these fiefdoms. And part of that is, frankly, the arrogance of power that has taken place. We are talking about power, and people are concerned. They relate longevity here with power, and in some cases that's true, and therefore they want that changed. Yes, I see what you mean. You're saying that the arrogance of power and the, the, the uh, district's constituency that agrees to allow a person to uh, build up seniority here are the same thing, and, and I think I, I, I would call what you call the arrogance of power the determination of the people to return a person to office for doing a good job. That's, that's the reward you get for doing good work, is that you're kept in your position. And, and to say that that's, that's an, an arrogance of power, I would disagree. Mr. Quillen has been here for many, many years uh, mostly in the minority, and he's been returned repeatedly, not because uh, they like the, the power that he wields uh, from his committee, but they, they, they like the job that he does in his district, and they reward him with re-election. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, he's considered to be lording it over his district uh, because uh, he's rewarded every two years. The, the issue, uh, I think, boils down to not what we think, but what the people think. 
This is about people exactly. and what the people we work for think. And I wouldn't be standing here or sitting here advocating that we pursue this debate any further if most of America hasn't been encouraging us to do so. Now, I haven't been out there saying, gee, Congress needs to do term limits first and foremost. That's, that's the issue. I've been out there saying debt reduction is the issue. Uh, but what keeps coming back is term limits. And that's what the people we work for say do something about. So they have made that decision that they want us to address this issue. I would suggest to you that what has happened is that because of some abuses of power, that we have seen some suspicion about the system which I will call the seniority system or which some of us would rather call the longevity system because it really is a question more of longevity in some cases than seniority because there is another argument out in America that says we are not interested in longevity. We are not interested in calling it seniority. We would rather have it done on merit. Put the most able people in charge and let them lead, not the people who have been there the longest. And that is part of this debate. And that will go right to the heart of Mr. McCollum's debate about six or 12 years, which is why I made the comments I did about having been here six years doing one role. And now I feel like I'm starting as a freshman again in another role, and I am. So maybe there is more merit in a 12-year term. Anyway, that was much longer than I intended. I apologize for keeping you from the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm opposed to term limits. Uh, and I find myself in agreement with Mr. Quillen's remarks of a little while ago and Mr. Mopley's and Mr. Hall's remarks of, of an hour or, or so ago. In a sense, I, I think, John, you, although you're quite correct about our, our mutual friend, Mr. Quillen, it's not so much that, that people are rewarding him, they're rewarding themselves. They found in him, they found in you, they found in Joe Mokley, in uh, Jerry Solomon, a lot of folks around here, someone who's done a good job in terms of representing them, pre presenting their point of view, taking care of their needs at home, and uh, they, want, they want to keep somebody they're comfortable with and who they think is, is, is doing uh, a good job. Uh, I, I must say, I've not said a word today because we've had a lot of people waiting to testify and but I uh, feel like saying a couple of things now. Of all of the, of all of the points in our, in our colleagues, our Republican colleagues' contract f with America, um, this is the one that's most worrisome to me. Most of the other things, not, not all, but most of the other things are at least in theory good and in many cases, quite frankly, overdue. Democrats have been bottling up legislation in some areas for far too long and, and, and hate to admit this publicly, but it's, it's very nice and refreshing in some respects. We're having a chance to talk about a lot of this stuff that we haven't had a chance to talk about on the floor before, including from the beginning, the reforms that you all took up successfully the first, uh, the first uh, day or two. Uh, I don't think, as we've said before, that, that the work on all these uh, subjects, uh, all the subject matter has been as careful as it should have been. But hopefully we can fix some of that up. But with respect to, to term limits, I really think that uh, the imposition of them would destroy the legislative branch of, of government, which most of us, I think, feel strongly is perhaps the, the most important branch of government. We have a six-year term limit for the, for the California State Legislature. It has destroyed our legislature, which several years ago I think was probably the best legislature in the country, which is now a total disaster. Members are bailing out after three or four years getting jobs with some of the industries uh, that they were the, supposed to be regulating, the jurisdiction of the committees on which they, um, which they serve. They're running for, other, running for other offices. The truth of the matter is that the only people in Sacramento anymore with any kind of institutional memory, this will be totally true in another two years when they're all gone, virtually all of them are gone, are the lobbyists, are the bureaucrats, are the staffers, uh, who in a very touching kind of way are almost putting aside some of their, their own interests and just trying to fill in for the lack of experienced legislators. There's been such a there's been such a, a, a turnover. Um, I won't argue the other the other matters I, I, that that one might want to argue. I, I would pick up on, on something that Mr. Conyer said. I, I don't think there is any evidence that the longer members of Congress uh, stay around here, the less serious they are about, for example, deficit reduction, which which Jerry Solomon, our our esteemed chairman, who feels very strongly as many of us do about it, was was also you know suggesting. Uh, I personally su suspect just the opposite. I think that members who've been here for a number of years have perhaps a, a broader point of view of the overall national interest, have more of a political will and more courage to do the kinds of things that are, that are correct, not necessarily politically correct, but to, to cast votes of principle because they have more support from the people back home who, you know, and whom they've gotten close to over the years and, and whom they've persuaded, you know, that they are thoughtful uh, kinds of people. I don't believe for a moment, just to make it personal for my good friends, Mr. McCollum, Mr. Kennedy, if, if you two principal gentlemen, and you both are, 
uh, you know, were to, were, to, were to have your places taken by some new member from men or women from Florida, that they'd be better on deficit reduction than you. You both feel strongly about it. You've both cast principled votes in the past. You will continue to, I'm sure. And it may be that someone else would cast the same kind of vote, but I don't believe for a moment that just having a new person from your district would do a better job than you. In fact, I know perfectly well, especially with Mr. McCall, whom I know quite well has been around a number of years and has been a very helpful and useful and experienced, if one can even mention that word anymore, a uh, member uh, of, the, of the Judiciary Committee, and some of us value experience and wisdom. You've got a lot of it. I'm sure Mr. Kennedy does too. Don't know him nearly so well, but I, I don't believe for a moment that a new member from Florida who was put in your position on the Judiciary Committee would contribute one-fifth what you have and what you continue to, to contribute. I just don't believe that automatic turnover is a necessarily good thing. You made the argument, Bill, before that, that you know, we all try to, incumbents try to please the people back home. Well, we do, I suppose, and part of our job is to represent the people back home, which is perhaps the same thing. But even if you had a limit of six years or 12 years, during those 12 years, you're going to try to please the people back home because you want to get yourself reelected at least for those 12 years. The only way you can make that a real argument, it seems to me, is to have one term of whatever length, and then you go. Then you do what you think is right. You don't pay attention to the people back home, or at least you don't worry, you don't have to worry, or are unable to worry about, about re-election. And I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense uh, either. But and it is an interesting debate. Um, and I, I, I personally do hope that, uh, that we remain a, a federal legislature, at least, which uh, allows people, if the folks back home value them, want them, have not found them wanting, uh, can return them here. We've had a huge amount of turnover the last three years. I tell my Democratic friends back home, even if they might, you know, disagree a great deal with Mr. with our new speaker, Mr. Gingrich, or our new majority leader, Mr. Army, the fact that those two gentlemen have been around for I think 17 and 15 years respectively is a very good thing. They care about the institution. They've been they've been through the paces a few times. They've got they've got the maturity that comes with just having been around having you know, some responsibility and understanding of what needs to be done to, to make an institution of any kind work well instead of turning it over to entirely new people, whoever they might be, from whichever party. So I, we, we all of us, I think, look forward to, of course, I'd be happy to yield. Um, I, you know, I respect you a lot just as you've come to know me because over the years we have worked together on many projects. Um, and I know what your point is. I, I frankly think we'll both walk out of here disagreeing on the bottom line today, but you have made a very telling point with respect to why I support the 12-year limit instead of the six-year limit. Twelve years is far, six would be disastrous. Well, I, I conclude the same thing you do, and I frankly believe that there will be good people lost here. I won't look at myself so much as I do people like you or Henry Hyde, or we can name some others who, who don't support term limits and some who do. Uh, but I just have looked at the good of the whole, and my conclusion, bottom line, is different from yours in the sense that I think that having term limits, you would mitigate, not to do away with, but mitigate uh, some of the interest in constantly worrying about re-election. But I think, as I said earlier, that if we could go to lengthen the terms two to four years, you'd take away a lot of the campaigning all the time, the fundraising part of it, things like that. And I know you believe in um, reforming the election laws and so on, but uh, this is an ultimate reform and that the same objective we would probably share in trying to mitigate some of this uh, is involved in the term limit feelings that I, that I have. But, but we would differ on the bottom line. I do believe term limits is, is necessary. I understand. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Didn't mean to take up so much time. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peterson. At this point, I'd like to recognize Mrs. Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've enjoyed the argument. It's, it's uh, refreshing to hear it made here in the open for the first time uh, in, in decades, and, and I appreciate it. I ha have so many things to say, and I know that there are others waiting to testify, so I will try to be brief. But um, I have to disagree with Mr. Bielenson, uh and I don't disagree with him very often, but um, from time to time I I I'm compelled uh, to state when I do, but I, I think that when you you said that uh, these gentlemen here, uh, if they were replaced by someone new, they couldn't be better on some issues like deficit reduction, and, and I agree with that. Perhaps um, the fact that a new person coming in is not the issue. It's a, a the fact that a, the new person who would be coming in is a person who has. Um, feet in the, the real world, the private industry, perhaps, um, um, and a mindset that that person won't be here forever, and that person will be going back into the real world once again, and not the world of politics, necessarily. 
And so, speaking for myself, and I'm relatively a new member, and and I don't really believe that six years is long enough either, and it would be a disaster, and, and I really prefer 12 for many reasons, but um, it, 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 it means to me that um, we have eight years in Ohio, so wherever that leaves me in the final debate, I don't know, but um, I know that my career is not going to be here, and I feel very um, supported by that, in that my decisions can be made on my own terms, and that my um, uh, my future does not rest here in the House of Representatives, and I think that that's what the whole ter or, uh, term limits argument means that that we have um, futures past here, and and so I really uh, feel strongly that new people will maybe not get up to speed quite as quickly, but the fact that they won't be here forever, they will be able to make the courageous decisions, and it ties right into uh, the chairman's argument uh, about the deficit and the problems we've got ourselves into, um, because, and um, Mr. Goss said in, the, in our final term we might be able to be more courageous, but I disagree with that a little bit. I think throughout our terms we're more courageous because we don't have to know that this is going to be the end all and be all to our career. So. I, um, I personally think, and I just want to um, quickly say that I think that the House of Representatives and the Senate should be in, in parity. I mean, they were, they were created as, as uh, bodies that should have been equal, that, that are equal, um, that are different but equal, and if we have uh, any less than 12 years or less than what the Senate has, then that will disrupt that very delicate balance that the uh, framers of our Constitution set out. So, uh, uh, ideologically, I think that the, the um, terms should be equal, whichever they are. And uh, with that, I'll uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I couldn't agree with the gentlelady more. And uh, if it's going to happen, that's the way it's going to be. All right. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been looking at Mr. McCollum's uh, amendment concerning uh, the changing um, the House of Representatives to four-year terms rather than two. I think that's an excellent reform. Thank you. I, uh, I hope you get your chance to offer that amendment. What's the feeling in the committee about that, uh, about changing the two-year term to a four-year term? Well, in the committee, we lost that on the voice vote. I didn't call for a record vote, but I can tell you, having done a Team 290, which we call our effort to get to 290, bipartisan effort on term limits, that it is the second most popular version in the House today. That is second only to the straight 12-year term limit of six two-year House terms, keeping it without lengthening it. But it doesn't quite rise up to the top. Part of that is because I don't think it's been debated as much. It is not one of those things we've focused on. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, Mr. Hall, in past years, while term limits have not been necessarily popular in the House, lengthening terms alone have been, and the Senate has rejected that concept long ago, years gone by, for the reason that uh, I've heard people talk about it here a little today. Uh, they're apparently, politically, as a pragmatic matter, afraid to face uh, House members who don't have to run for re-election in the off uh, year if you lengthen the terms. If you have four years, you have uh, elections in the Senate every two uh, alternating around. And that's why, even though I know Mr. Quillen expressed concern about it, and others I've heard say the same thing, don't like our requiring you to resign to run, that that provision is in here. Uh, because just as a pragmatic matter, I don't believe the other body would ever send forth to the states for ratification a lengthening a four-year term if they did not have a provision in it that required you to resign unless you're in the last year of your term. So uh, that it just hadn't gotten enough debate. Uh, my judgment is if we got more debate on this, it would be even more popular because it has a better rationale than any of the other term limit proposals. I think it's a very popular amendment. I, I have been asked many, many times, and not asked, but it's been stated by our constituents. I don't know about your district, but people say, why do you have to run every other year? That's right. And uh, I think one of the greatest reforms we could do as far as the tremendous amount of money that we spend on campaign, which is getting ludicrous, is, is going to a four-year term and not spending so much time that we have to spend to raise money. I mean, it's, it's demeaning to our office. It really is. It's demeaning to the country to have to spend the kind of money that we do. And as I said earlier, I mean, this, we keep going the way we are. It's going to be a millionaire's club. This House and this Senate, you're going to have to be a very wealthy man to run, or you're going to have to spend all your time raising money. And that's demeaning. That's wrong. And the people, they don't want us to do this. 
Well, that's why I uh, suggested that uh, you had an excellent idea tying campaign finance reform to, to if this is really going to ever take wings, uh, that would be an excellent way uh, to bring uh, a major, serious, constructive revision to the process by which we come to the uh, federal legislature. And I think it's an, an excellent uh, idea, and I, I hope that that doesn't get lost um, among this general debate that's going on. I, I really back that. Is, any, is anybody, I haven't looked at the amendments here, all of them. Is there an amendment on here tie, trying to tie some kind of uh, simple campaign finance reform to this bill? I, I don't think any of the amendments no. proposed do that. No. It uh, would be difficult with constitutional amendment, Mr. Hall, at, uh, you know, campaign campaign finance is just a, a legislative matter, most of us think. But your point is well made because in the three, four-year terms, you, you know, that's one of the primary reasons that we want to lengthen terms is to limit that constant fundraising and that constant involvement in, in going out and having to spend your time doing that. It's not that we want to take members away from the public. Uh, we expect them to go back. They're going to have to go back in this day and age. In fact, most members fly home every weekend today. Back when the Founding Fathers created the Constitution, of course, you did, they only served a couple of months up here. It wasn't a full-time deal. I don't see us going away from year-round Congresses. Uh, but they went home. When they went home, they went home by a horse and buggy. And I think the two-year idea of getting the members close to the public was necessary probably then. Today, with the airplane, uh, that's not true. Members are going to go home. They're going to be expected to go home. But the problem, the evil, is the constant worrying about re-election in the sense of both pleasing interest groups to get re-elected and always out there raising money, which, again, the four-year uh, term lim limit length would help a great deal on. Well, it's a very attractive amendment, and what mm -hmm. Mr. Conyers said mm -hmm. about campaign finance is a very mm -hmm. good idea that I back, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. diaz Balot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I realize we have a vote. It'll be very brief. Um, obviously, any time one is discussing the Constitution of the United States, uh, it must be uh, taken very, very seriously. Um, I, I believe that the uh, uh, primary motivator for the term limits uh, groundswell uh, in the United States uh, was the seniority system. Uh, and the seniority system was not something foreseen in the Constitution. Uh, and, and yet it has facilitated the acquisition of great power simply because of time served. And that's, I think, that's an, a, a, an undemocratic concept, uh, the acquisition of power simply by service of time. I know the other side of the, the argument that it's, uh, it facilitates peace and uh, comity and uh, other things. Uh, civil conduct among members or things like that. But it's, it's, it has nothing to do with elections. And as was stated before by one of the panelists, that's what we're all about in the United States, elections. So let's keep in mind that the way that you get rid of the seniority system for sure, and not by rule that can be changed, is by limiting terms. And so even though I see a lot of sides to this issue, uh, because I, I'm aware of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of parliamentary career, that, that there's some good to that um, in terms of acquisition of knowledge, not, not knowledge of historical reality, and other things. Uh, I think that we would definitely set aside forever the seniority system with the, uh, with the, the imposition of term limits. I will say one thing to end because of the time constraint, because I don't want to... Uh, take up much, uh, more, much more time. I think it really would be a serious mistake if we impose a, a, a term limit that is not uniform. I've heard that there's some debate about not preempting that, that, uh, that aspect. That would be, that would l leave us with the evils of seniority. In other words, somebody would have two years here or six years here Somebody then would be limited to eight years, somebody else to 12 years. That's something that makes absolutely, in my humble view, no sense whatsoever. And so I hope that as we proceed, we will at least, whether if we decide on 12 or whatever, and I happen to favor the, uh, the 12 year, thinking it's the most reasonable. I hope that at least we realize that we wouldn't even be doing that 
if we uh, do not uh, make it a, a, a uniform situation. I had one question. I'll just uh, bring it forth and perhaps maybe in private, Mr. Conyers, because of lack of time, we might talk about it. But you talked about the fact that, uh, that you, uh, you, you thought that you, you said, I would favor connecting campaign finance reform to the notion of term limits. You said that. Uh, I assume you don't mean you want to put campaign finance law in the Constitution of the United States. You assume correctly. Okay, but but you're not clear as to what you mean, so I think we need to talk about that. Uh, we we need a, we can move with a statute uh, as well as a constitutional amendment uh, connecting up the relationship between the excessive amount of time Mike, that you must spend raising money. Mike, Mike, please. So uh, that's that's precisely. Uh, I do well, see a relationship. I do not see it in, in the same constitutional amendment. Okay, we'll have time okay, to discuss I'd be that. delighted. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. McGinnis of Colorado. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think that the uh, term limit debate is very interesting, and I think that most members in some fashion or another support term limits. I think it's an excellent idea, and I think it's an idea that will move this country forward in great strides. But there are some... Uh, maneuvers going on that I think would be devastating. One is my good friend uh, and colleague, uh, Mr. Lincoln Diaz, from uh, Florida states, you've got to have uniformity. Uh, in Colorado, for example, we have a water which is cherished by many states. Um, and, and if we had less of a term limit in Colorado than uh, downriver stream state, for example, we put ourselves in great jeopardy for obvious reasons. The other thing that strikes me because I cannot find any reason uh, or, just, uh, or logic to it, but strikes me as strictly political maneuvering is this retroactivity stuff we're talking about. Uh, immediate retroactivity, does that mean if uh, the final state passes it or passes in the middle of a term that all of a sudden half the United States Senate or half the United States Congress resigns? Uh, can you imagine what would happen? To, I mean, look what happens. I'm not yielding. I'm not, okay, I'm not re and I'm not just referring to Mr. Connor's statement. I'm just saying that you can imagine. I mean, look at the financial markets yesterday just in response to one person. I think we have to think some of these things out, and I truly believe that the retroactivity amendments are, are nothing more than political maneuvering and I intend to look at everyone who is sponsoring retroactivity because I'm going to be most interested in their uh, past stance on retroactivity and term limitations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Mr. And Mrs. Walholtz of Utah. I'll be brief in the interest of time so we can all reach our vote. Uh, I, I simply want to say that I think campaign finance reform is an important issue uh, that needs to be discussed. I think it is one of the reasons that we are here talking about term limits, and it's the reason that I joined with the bipartisan reform team in some of the proposals that we brought forward this week that, frankly, I hope we strengthen when they come to the floor for a vote. Uh, I just want to express my concern about the idea of four-year term limits. I know that it would be in, in some ways easier for members of Congress and their communities. But I have some concerns that this House is supposed to respond to the will of the people faster than the Senate can, and I think in some ways much faster than the White House can, because of the four-year and six-year terms established for those two entities. And I have some concerns that if we move this House to a four-year term, that we may not be able to respond to the public's will as quickly as we should. I think the elections of last fall were a reflection of a public who wanted change. And I would hate to have to see the people in my community wait four years if they're dissatisfied with the job that I'm doing or someone who may precede me or, or succeed me. I would hate to see them have to wait four years to make the change if they're dissatisfied with who is representing them. So that's just a concern I want to express, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, thank the gentleman for coming in and testifying. Open to the public. We're going to recess this uh, meeting until three o'clock. I understand there may be another meet, another vote coming up very shortly. And Barney Frank, you'll be the first one on.
The Republicans' contract with America calls for votes on two proposals. One, to restrict House members to three two-year terms. The other, to limit them to six two-year terms. Senators would face two six-year term limits under either proposal. The full House is expected to debate the bill later this month. And later on C-SPAN, the Senate Agriculture Committee looks into the 1995 Farm Bill. Coverage begins at 2.35 a.m. Eastern, 11.35 p.m. Pacific Time.